this is a overview of the concepts that we teach our fellows. And again, we now hire my uh, golf coach who coaches me, still coaches me. I actually engaged him for about 18 months in 2006. And so all of our fellows get coached by this golf coach with performance skills. So it's the driving range time, sitting around in, sitting around in a group, the individual coaching, and it's made a remarkable difference in the entire fellowship. And there's just dozens of stories of how he's helped our fellows out. So basically, my whole thing is that I want you to understand that right now, wherever you are, fourth year, fifth year, chief resident year, this is it. This is your life. Every patient, every time in front of you is real time. And even though you quote, aren't in attending, your set of eyes and ears is helping take care of this human being in front of you. But to do that, to really do that, to solve a problem, you have to get accurate data. That means you have to actually listen. And we're actually not really programmed to do that very well. Let's see, how's this working? Jason? Details. Any, th any thoughts, really, questions really quick before we get into the talk? Christian, you always, you always have a question. Any comments? No comments. So John, my fellow right now, sorry. We good? We good? OK. So the purpose of the talk. It, it is critical to assess all aspects of a situ situation to make an accurate diagnosis and implement an effective treatment plan. So just having a pathologic finding on an x-ray means absolutely nothing. And again, with the whole business of medicine these days in volume, we're not getting all the data to make a correct decision. So this, the only part of the talk I can cover today is your own capacity to listen. And mostly listen to yourself. So this is written in 1927 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Francis Peabody is a very famous, or I'm not sure what kind of physician he was, but he used to lecture medical students on the care of the patient. He wrote a book that's about five chapters called The Care of the Patient. And he published this article, and basically disease in man is never exactly the same as disease in an experimental animal. For in man, the disease at once affects and is affected by what we call the emotional life. Thus, a physician who attempts to take care of the patient while he neglects this factor is as unscientific as the investigator who neglects to control all the conditions that affect his or her experiment. Now, you've all heard this, right? You've heard psychosocial issues, whatever it is. But what I'm going to point out later in the talk is that when you're upset, it changes your body's chemistry, right? So when you're adrenalized, it shuts down the blood supply to your stomach. It shuts down the blood supply to the frontal lobe of your brain. It increases the blood supply to your muscles. It causes your skin to sweat. So what happens, what he calls emotional life, actually changes the body's physiology. So if you're not taking those factors into account, you are not, being, you're not doing this correctly. One of the essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity, for the secret of care is in caring for the patient. Now, the paradigm shift I'd like to give you today is that part of my burnout I was seeing pathology, doing surgeries. I'm an excellent surgeon, and a lot of satisfaction with doing that. But medicine is mind-boggling repetition. In, in a lot of ways, it's not that interesting. What makes medicine interesting is actually the patient. So you, you see the same thing over and over and over again to the patients. So my fellows keep asking me, don't you ever get tired of hearing yourself talk? The answer is no. <laughs> I don't. Uh, it, so my current fellow back there, John, I, I, I have a hobby of torturing fellows, by the way, and John's uh, my target right now. So uh, it's been a real paradigm shift for John in the last three weeks. And so it's, it's interesting. But what, so you're saying the same thing over and over and over again, back pain, leg pain, radiculopathy, disc, tumor, infection, whatever it is. And they're interesting cases, but this mind memory repetition, but each person is so individual, that's what makes it interesting. So the paradox is you actually take time to listen and get connected to your patients. That's what prevents the burnout. As you connect to the patient, you connect to yourself. As you connect to yourself, you connect to the patient. Then you make an accurate diagnosis. We're doing spine surgery on people, for instance, on people that have not slept for three years. We know from the data that lack of sleep induces chronic pain. So it makes no sense to do spine surgery on somebody who's not sleeping. But you have to listen just a little bit. 
This is written in 1927, where Dr. Peabody was concerned about the onslaught of technology into medicine in 1927. And his article is very compelling. So if you have a chance to look at this, it's 1927, New England Journal of Medicine. I'll email it to anybody who would like to. It's a remarkable article. But the issue is it's physiological. There's a 99.9% .9 chance that any symptom you have in your body, I mean, think of your days, think of your stresses, you can be upset and having a stomach ache or headache or backache, your body chemistry changes. So somehow medicine has gone over 90% into structural causes for everything. And when we see a structural problem, we think that's the cause of the pain. It's simply not true. So I'm going to define the problem in terms of society, the patient, and physician. And I'm just going to touch on these briefly. Again, this is a huge talk. I give a one-week seminar on this. But I just wanted to give you a taste again of an overview. So I'm going to talk about society, patient, and the physician. Let's just talk about society really quickly. Right now, the disability costs just for back problems alone are about $635 billion. 5% of the patients consume 55% of the medical resources. And then more than 100 million people in the United States have chronic pain. Okay, so we all heard the data. We all know the, the problems, how they're getting, getting worse. But the bottom line is, the bottom line is with this kind of data, medicine is not solving the problem. Medicine is the one institution that's very trusted by most people still. With this kind of data, we are not solving the problem. So from the patient's perspective, I want you to put yourself in the patient's shoes for a second. Now just ask yourself, I'm assuming most people in this room have been patients at one point in time or another. So I've had two back surgeries, I've had knee surgery, I have gone through different issues, and every time I'm a patient, it's an incredibly common experience. And I, when I was your age, I wasn't really in, into being a patient that much. I hadn't, didn't have that much wrong with me, really. And uh, it's very enlightening to be a patient, but put yourselves into the patient's shoes. OK? So what happens is that you've all heard the psychosocial issues make a difference. And surgeons, surgeons will wink at you and say, well, you know, don't operate on somebody you don't like. Well, again, that's prejudicial, right? I mean, why? So just because you don't like the person doesn't mean you shouldn't take care of them. Your job is to take care of every patient every time that walks into your clinic. I don't care what the pathology is, whether it's surgical or non-surgical. So I gave a, st a little study out of Utah. I'm sorry, this one was out of European Spine Journal. Well, they gave us called the DRAM, which is a combination of a depression score and a somatic score to 125 orthopedic patients. And 35%, 35 patients ranked themselves as distressed, and 54 patients were at risk. And they found out that the surgeons could identify psychological distress only 26% of the time. But what was sobering, it didn't matter, didn't matter if it was a medical student, junior faculty, senior faculty, experienced veteran spine surgeon, nobody could predict the patient in the context of a busy clinic. Couldn't do it. Another study out of Utah showed the same thing with about 45%. Same thing. Didn't matter what level of physician you were. The problem is in the context of a busy clinic, you can't do it. Not going to happen. What's even more sobering, I wrote a paper in December in the Global Spine Journal called The Role of CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, in Treating Chronic Pain. It turns out fighting chronic pain is like fighting a forest fire. You have to treat every aspect at the same time. And we know anxiety, depression, and catastrophes all have a negative outcome. We all know that. But the study of Baltimore showed that only 10% of orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons were using routine psychological screening in their care. There's another book out of Australia by Ian Harris calling Surgery the Ultimate Placebo. And he presents only a book of procedures that have been proven not to work that surgeons keep doing. We simply ignore the data. Everybody keeps screaming for more data. Nobody's listening. We don't need more data. We have the data. We already know this stuff. Massive randomized studies, massive meta-analyses, massive systematic reviews. We have the data. We know sleep's an issue. We know anxiety, depression, catastrophes is an issue. We now know through the recent neuroscience research, particularly out of Chicago. Do you know Dr. Apkarian, by the way? I mean, his stuff's unbelievable, right? So we know from the neuroscience research out of Boulder, Chicago, San Diego, that the brain processes emotional pain and physical pain in the same way. Same set of circuits, same physiological response. Okay, the data is right there. Medicine is at least 25 years right now behind that data. We have the data. We just haven't. We're not using it. The so consequences are: they document depression, 
longer recovery, increased complications, and poorer patient compliance. So why wouldn't you address these issues if you know the emotional factors affect this body's physiology, you jump in and do a spine surgery, and there's a paper not presented right now, but there's also data that I became aware of that if you do surgery in the presence of chronic pain, that you can actually induce chronic pain as a complication of the surgery 40% of the time. In other words, if you have chronic neck pain and you perform a hernia surgery, you will induce chronic pain at the hernia site up to 40% of the time. If I was having a dural tear rate of 40%, I would not be in business. 10% of those patients became permanent. If I had a 10% neurological complication rate, I would not be in business. So what it boils down to is that the same circuits of the brain are already lit up in chronic pain. You add in a hernia operation, and those circuits are already fired up. You just plug it in a different set of symptoms. The other problem is, I call this a pit of despair, is that they did experiment back in the 70s with monkeys where the way they induced depression in monkeys is they put them in a cage like this that had a narrower bottom than a top, but they had an open cage at the top. So the monkeys could climb up the side, look out, and slide right back down. And so they had tried all sorts of ways of inducing depression, and this is how they do it, did it. It was basically dashed hopes. So how many times do we offer patients treatments that have actually been documented not to work? We know facet blocks don't work, rhizotomies don't work, we know random physical therapy doesn't work. We know lack of sleep is a problem, but we don't treat it. We're doing spine surgery for back pain that has a 22% success rate, 22%. There's not one paper, by the way, that shows spine surgery works. The only paper that suggests that it works, I mean, for back pain. So the only study that suggests that it works is 2001, which says that it's a little bit better than doing nothing, but I'm suspecting doing nothing is not going to work either. So we know that surgery for back pain does not work very well. But the other problem from both the patient standpoint and the surgeon standpoint, this is an overlap, it's called mirror neurons, where when you smile at a baby, the baby smiles back. It's not because the baby's happy. You just, stimulated that part, you just stimulated that part of the brain. They've done also studies where they have a football quarterback throwing the ball down the field. And the fans bring the throwing center lights up. So they're vicariously throwing that football 60 yards. And when somebody yawns, of course, the whole room yawns. It's mirror neurons. The problem is you have an angry patient, they're going to trigger you. And if you're having a bad day, you're going to trigger the patient. Well, that patient chronic pain is frustrated. They're trapped. And when you trigger them, the reaction is going to be extreme. When I give this different lectures to different groups about chronic pain, I'll just ask you the question, how many of you in this, how many of you in this room enjoy treating chronic pain? OK, so most of your practice is chronic pain. So what are you going to do? OK, so again, you have to get the correct diagnosis. So I gave a lecture at Mayo Clinic about two years ago about enjoying the management of chronic pain. And again, I'm going I'm to actually, I hate to sound like I'm selling a book, but I am right this second. So this book is a self-directed process. We'll talk about it later in the talk. Then I say, hey, look, here's the book. See you back in a couple weeks. We have about 800 patients that are now pain-free. Okay, it's a self-directed process, and it turns out it's very time efficient. It's actually somewhat contraindicated to talk to an angry patient. So what happens is that patients that are angry, in fact, the only prognostic factor for success is people's willingness to engage. So they come back, they're excited, they're doing their thing, they're getting better, but they actually come out of the pain pathways and into non-pain pathways. So treating chronic pain is by far and away the most rewarding part of my practice. And that was not true for the first 20 years of my practice. That's only going through my own severe burnout, which was chronic pain. I had 16 of these 30 symptoms that are mentioned in the book from an, from an over-adrenalized nervous system. And I only learned this from my own experience. I was not taught this anywhere in my training. There's maybe 50, 50 of us around the country now doing these concepts, but it's very self-directed, it's very time efficient, and it's very, very rewarding and consistent. So if you have, you know, this energy in the room, that's one thing. I mean, just looking at that picture gives you sort of a feeling of being relaxed versus facing a patient like this. So that patient is going to trigger you just from mirror neurons. It's not psychological. That patient who's angry coming at you is going to trigger your reaction. So they have, they're so trapped, they're so frustrated that when they get triggered, it's like an explosion. But guess what? 
neurosurgeons aren't exact, um, and orthopedic surgeons, we're not that relaxed. So when we get triggered, we have the same sort of explosion. So I'm going to spend most of this on the physician part of it. And again, I give one or two talks this year. So I'm just going to tell you that we use these same principles in the operating room, basically mindfulness-based surgery. And just picture the operating room as your metaphor for life. Obviously, lots of stress in the operating room. And we treat performance skills with the model being performance equals skill minus interference. So we're taught skills, but we are really not taught consistency of performance. So would you rather have an A surgeon operate on you who's going through divorce and is having some bad days, sort of bad days, or have a B surgeon who knows his limits or her limits and will consistently do a good job? Who wants the A surgeon? Who wants the B surgeon? Right. So, but we're not talking consistency of performance. I had no awareness in this. This, and still I started working with this golf coach, David Alamey, who became my performance coach. And basically, the interferences are anxiety, frustration, being distracted, complacent, where my favorite one personally is being rushed. I'm going to ask you a different question. How many of you as residents and fellows feel like you're being rushed by your tenants? Okay. My wife's a tap dancer. Okay, She's not rushing through her tap dance to get to the next performance. One of my fellows, actually one of my partners, is a concert pianist. I mean, he's not rushing through his performance to get to the next performance. I mean, what would happen if you're rushing through a concert pianist piece, right? And then remember, you have a human life in your hands, and you're rushing. It's not logical. In fact, it's dangerous, right? And John and I have been working on this a little bit about the whole thing about Speed is precision. The concert pianist is pretty quick. I think it's a superhuman task. And to be able to do that requires a large amount of precision. So we did a case yesterday that John thought took forever. He looked up and we were done in three hours, right? So it, the speed comes from precision and efficiency. So MD stress is up. Every person I talked to, the, the, the faculty yesterday have the same complaints. There's academic, political, patient demands, legal demands, 30 to 40% of physicians would choose not to enter the medical field. That's now up to almost 50%, and less would recommend it to their children. Okay, So my, th my son thinks I'm out of my mind. I may have a job. I have all sorts of things going on. I have prestige, honor, all this sort of stuff. And the burnout rate is 65%. makes no sense to him. I have 20 colleagues now, different suicide, four medical school classmates, my fellow spine fellow, one of my colleagues here at Swedish about five years ago walked out of my operating room, shook my hands, said, nice case, and went out and shot himself. Two more fellows from Minneapolis committed suicide about three years ago. Just heard another, I just heard another suicide about a few weeks ago. So women have 100%, many 70% higher risk inside the profession than the general population. We have easy access to methodology. We're penalized for seeking help. In 2002, I was actively suicidal. I crossed the line, ready to go, and I'm not sure why I didn't do it. So I was all December 21. I wrote a thing in our North, in our North American Spine Society publication called Spine Line about physician suicide in my journey. We're going to talk about that in a second. But the sources of discontentment is complexity, long hours, stress. We're overloaded with patient demands and less organizational support. In fact, now we have more organizational demands, and we have less autonomy. We have less reward for the effort. Our efforts often border on heroic, just getting here. Difficult patients are becoming more difficult in too many hours. So my definition of burnout is a little bit simpler. Are you a thank God it's Friday or thank God it's Monday? OK. So I used to get to the point where I was so burned out, I was having complications. I was not in a performance mode that if I get to Friday without a complication, I go, man, I did it. So now it's changed. So I was trying to get through the week, trying to survive, getting through to Friday. And now I'm excited about Monday. I'm truly excited about going to work on Monday. I'm excited about my clinic. I'm excited about tra training the fellows. They're challenging. And uh, it's fun. We have a good time. So really, this is what you're here for. So are you excited about Monday or not excited about Monday? But here's a real reason for burnout. And in physician groups, everybody's heart drops through the floor when they see this work. 
So I remember my first 15 years of practice, I was not allowed to feel anxiety in my own mind. So my facade was being a robot, superhuman, you know, the, the person who could solve anything. And my personal deal was I was so busy suppressing anxiety. I mean, I, you know, Minneapolis is a high level spine fellowship. I did not become a major spine surgeon by having anxiety. I became a major spine surgeon by suppressing anxiety. Well, guess what? A Harvard study shows when you suppress thought, you actually have a huge trampoline effect and it gets worse. So you can dissociate for years. But I went from having literally no anxiety, I did not know what the word meant, to having panic attacks in 1990. I was driving across the 520 bridge and has this I have a panic attack. And I'm going, what the hell is this? So when it exploded, it came out brutally. And I'm going to explain why that's a problem with surgery particularly, because we can't admit it. We have no resources. We're under a ridiculous amount of stress. And we expect to perform under a huge amount of stress without resources and no endpoint. So how's that going to work? Not well. So I'm, I want to switch gears for a second and talk about that anxiety is not a psychological disorder, period, end of story. It has nothing to do with psychology. So basically our human behavior is guided by your body's chemical response to sensory input. So I have a metaphor I use called the junction box, which is the sum total of the nervous system at any, po at any given point in time. So your body has all these senses vision, touch, sound, taste, and smell. It comes into the nervous system. And it's coming in, I get different numbers, but it's something like 30 or 40 million bits of data per second are coming into your brain. So they've actually counted the receptors in the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, the skin. So you have all the sensory input coming into your nervous system. It gets unscrambled by your nervous system. Then the sum total is either pleasant, neutral, or unpleasant. Now, if the sum total is pleasant, then your body secretes oxytocin, dopamine, the GABA drugs like Valium type drugs and relaxation. So you get this chemical surge, then you feel relaxed. But what you're feeling is that chemical surge. If your body has unpleasant sensations, loud sounds, etc., your body secretes adrenaline, cortisol, and, and endorphins, then you feel that chemical surge, then you feel anxiety. But what you're feeling is that chemical surge. So again, you know, symphony, relax, your body's relaxed, you get these relaxing chemicals, et cetera, and your body's relaxed. You're feeling relaxed. Same thing when you get loud sounds, you know, you're getting adrenaline and cortisol, then you're feeling anxiety. Same thing with touch, you know, light touch, massage, relaxation, you know, relaxation drugs, you're feeling relaxed, you're getting the GABA drugs, versus this, okay? Adrenaline, cortisol, anxiety. Again, anxiety is a neurophysiologic response to sensory input. So our human body is taking all the sensory input in, and then we're acting in a way that keeps us safe. And the nociceptive system, by the way, is not pain. So when you feel pain, you've actually exceeded the boundaries of the nociceptive system. This comes out of Chicago, where Baliki is also a guy who's pretty prominent with that carrion, where when you're sitting in your chairs, your body's unconsciously shifting so you don't get bed sores, you don't get pressure sores, right? You're not thinking about it, your body's just doing it. So your body's behavior is in a range that keeps you safe and comfortable. So the nociceptive system keeps you within a range of behaviors so you don't actually feel pain that's not nociceptive pain, it's actually failure of the nociceptive system. In other words, you have exceeded the limits of the nociceptive system. So what happens is that thoughts also, this comes out of Chicago also, have the same response. So thoughts can be pleasant, where you get positive chemicals, reward chemicals, and you feel relaxed. Or unpleasant thoughts can give you the same physiologic response. It's the same area of the brain, by the way. You have adrenaline and cortisol, then you feel anxious. But there's a major, major problem with thoughts. Anybody want to tell me the problem with thoughts? What's different about thoughts? So thoughts are sensory input that work in the same area of the brain as far as sort of, sort of the same area, not the same patterns exactly, it, it gives you the same physiologic response as the other sensory input. And John, you can't answer this. And neither can you, Dan. So what, what's different about thoughts? You can't escape them. You can't escape your thoughts. 
As you get older, thoughts can become stronger because it was repetition. You, they get programmed in your brain. So almost every human being, by the way, has anxiety. Very, very few people admit it. We cope with it in a massive number of ways. If you suppress the thoughts, is what surgeons tend to do, particularly me, they get even stronger, but your body's physiology is cranking away. And then you can mask it by being a workaholic or some type of addiction. And, you, and it's, so I won't go there. So you suffer, suppress, or mask, and none of those are going to work. You cannot escape your thoughts. So your body has the same adrenaline response. It does the adverse sensory input. It turns out that negative thoughts or unpleasant thoughts, they now call them URTs, unconstructive repetitive thoughts, probably are the basis for all chronic pain. It's certainly a basis for anxiety, which is a physiologic response to sensory input, but you can't escape them. So then you talk about them. The anxiety is part of the conscious brain, which is a million times stronger than the unconscious brain. So talk therapy is like taking down El Capitan with a pickaxe. It's not going to happen. Then your body is full of adrenaline. It's like driving your car down the freeway in second or third gear. It's going to break down. So you have a sustained adrenaline response, cortisol, from trying to escape these thoughts. The harder you try, the worse it gets. It turns out that from my burnout, extreme anxiety is what happened. And I'm a orthopedic spine surgeon, for goodness sakes. Then what happens, we won't go into this too much, is that you have what I call them neurophysiologic sort of symptoms, is that when your body's full of adrenaline, each organ system is going to respond in its own way. These are my symptoms I had when I had an adrenalized nervous system, ringing in my ears, burning into my feet, anxiety, panic attacks, PTSD, extreme depression. I developed tendonitis, crushing chest pain, itching scalp, if I quit doing the tools that I'm going to teach you this morning, just for a, a quick overview, these, skin, these little skin rashes pop up on my wrist. My feet start to burn. My ears start to ring. So a lot of times I won't even feel anxious, and all of a sudden these skin rashes pop up. So I work backwards to figure out what's going on. So let's talk about just the briefest overview of the solutions. It's based on neuroplasticity, is that remember when your body's under stress, that's a threat to your well-being. Your body's going to automatically you know, secrete adrenaline and cortisol. That's automatic. My friend Fred Luskin pointed out that the human body is designed only to survive. It's not designed to have a good time. So it's an automatic response. It's pre-programmed in. You have to be aware of what's going on. So your brain is going to develop in terms of where you place this attention. So your attention is trying to fight anxiety, solve it, talk about it you actually increase the pathway. So it turns out that talk therapy is somewhat contraindicated in anxiety because you just fire up the circuits. And it's a million to one ratio anyway. So your brain will respond exactly where you place its attention. And there's four ways of doing this. We call it reprogramming, relaxing, reframing, and reconnecting. Again, just brief overviews here. The reprogramming is the basic starting point. And with neuroplasticity, you have to understand what's going on first. In other words, you have to understand your automatic survival response before you can change it. What doesn't work, what takes surgeons down, by the way, is positive thinking. What you need to do is positive substitution. So I want everybody to grab a piece of paper in front of them, if you have a piece of paper in front of you. And I just want to simply write down your thoughts for 30 seconds. Just any, anything you want. Positive, negative, anything you want. You have a piece of paper there. Everybody just do it. It takes a second. Now, I'll just tell you that this exercise, after 15 solid years of extreme anxiety, extreme symptoms, within two weeks started to break up these pathways. So you can't escape your thoughts. We, so basically, we call it writing and ripping. You simply write down your thoughts a couple times a day, five or 10 minutes, tear them up. And the reason why you tear them up is for two reasons. One of them is to write with freedom. And second of all, it's actually contraindicated to analyze these things. It's like, it's like putting your hand into a hornet's nest. Remember, these are survival reactions. There's nothing there. If you want to find yourself by analyzing the past, you're screwed. I was in psychotherapy twice a week for 13 years. I mean, I was desperate. Bam, I went right down the toilet. It turns out when you put your brain on these pathways, you reinforce them, right? So all the running does simply separates you. You don't want to analyze them. You don't want to fix them. I'm not a neuroscientist, but I think the reason why the writing works is that you simply separate from these thoughts. Remember, you can't escape your thoughts. By writing them down, they're there. So there's awareness and a separation that's connected to vision and feel. So 
So go ahead, 30 seconds. So go ahead and just write down anything. And it can be positive or negative. The book, by the way, talks about negative writing. It's not negative anymore. The research shows that it can be positive or negative. Any thoughts? All right, now just tear them up. Just right now, just grab your piece of paper, just tear it up. Done. And I write, you know, once or twice a day, maybe one to two minutes, maybe ten minutes sometimes. Uh, a couple days ago, I wrote for, you know, 20 minutes. So it's like brushing your teeth, once or twice a day. And the data on this is unbelievable. So this is a review paper published in 2005 on 84 papers. There are now over 300 research papers that says the writing works. We don't know how it works or why it works. But for some reason, just simply writing down thoughts breaks up the cycle. There's different types of different methodology, but this is sort of the basic one. So remember, there's awareness, separation, reprogramming. So I think the writing does an awareness and separation in one move. And then what we do during surgery is I call it active meditation. And this is what we teach our fellows all day long. And Dan's now become an expert at this, right, Dr. DiLorenzo? So everybody just take, just feel where you're sitting. So in surgery, remember the interference is performance equals skill minus interference. The inference is your anxiety, frustration, being rushed, okay, complacency, and distracted. So I probably do this 100 times a case for three to five seconds. Is There's three parts. You relax, let it stabilize, and you pick a sensation. And what you're doing is you're simply switching sensory input. So instead of being on one of these sensations here, you know, instead of your thoughts running the show, we go to feel. Like in surgery, we go to this light touch. And so my golf instructor is such a great performance coach because it's light touch on the golf club. Not that I've learned that yet, but at least in surgery, I can at least do light touch on the instruments. So just everybody, just for a second, drop your shoulders. It's relaxation, stabilization, increasing the increase, just picking a sensation. Taste your food, feel the breeze. Just feel, just feel where you're sitting. So just let your shoulder muscles relax. So pretend you're in surgery. Let your shoulder muscles relax. Let it stabilize for half a second. And then just feel where you're sitting. Or in surgery, I'll just feel my shoulders. Or I'll just you know, feel the touch of the instrument. What's happened in my first 15 years of practice, I had thousands of thoughts that would come into my brain during the case. Everything. And what's happened with repetition, I can go through a 10-hour case and have like two thoughts that are distracting. So I'm so connected to the feel. Remember, when you're connected to the sensation, you're now connected to the moment. You've all heard this phrase about be here now. But when you're connected to a sensation, you are here now. So what happens is my whole body is involved. I'm feeling the move. My complication rate's probably dropped. I'm just guessing 80%. John, how many complications have you seen me see have this year? No, it's, actually, don't say it. <laughs> Not many. But that was like, I mean, my biggest attraction was being rushed, and I was jumping. So we have a whole deal where we walk in the room. We're not in a rush. I drape the patient certain ways, like a ceremony. And the whole concept of surgery is like sculpting. So I have the best time doing a microdiscectomy after 30 years. We had the best time yesterday doing a really nice case on a prednisone patient, went beautifully. But every move, every case, every time is practice precision where you don't have to. That's light touch, feel. So again, just drop your shoulders for a second. I'm in surgery, and I was a little bit frustrated. John's acting up again. And I just, you know, just go to light touch. Done. And John doesn't see it, but you know, I, I do it hundreds of times during a case, and literally my complication rate has probably dropped 80%. Plus, I have a great time. So I went from dreading surgery getting through the week to having the best time. We have a good time. Don't we have a good time? He has no choice on that one. And actually, that is one of the things about our fellowship. And this comes up to the next thing about reframing. Remember, we talk about reprogramming, relaxing. So the other thing that the act of meditation does is a form of mindfulness. You switch sensory input, but you also de adrenalize your nervous system. So if you think in terms of anxiety, simply feeling adrenaline, as you decrease the adrenaline, you decrease your anxiety, right? So reframing is that, you know, I, I read, a book, read a book called Man's Search for Meaning, which is Victor Frankl's story of surviving Auschwitz. I read a book called The Swerve, which pulls you right into the Middle Ages. We have nothing to complain about. 
I mean, politics, administration, difficult staff guys. And my, again, my golf coach taught me that you use your adversity as an opportunity to practice these tools. But in the big picture of human history, we have nothing to complain about. You know, we get caught up in all this little details of the residency, fellowship, future, whatever it is. So just literally changing your story makes a huge difference, being grateful for what you have. One of my OBGYN friends would tell me that every time she got out of her car and put foot on the sidewalks, all she could think about is how much she hated administration. Well, that's not a great start to your day. Final thing, which is obviously a whole lecture in itself, is that you combine the writing with meditation. That's a, it's a awareness separation reprogramming tool with active meditation being remote programming. The more complex level of letting go is simply forgiveness. And I have a whole lecture on perfectionism in surgery. And we're not, we're pretty hard on ourselves. People are hard on us. Pain pathways are permanent, so are play pathways. So about five years ago, I just decided to have a good time. So my friend, friend Luskin on Stanford wrote a book called Forgive for Good, remarkably simple book on forgiveness. He did four major researches on four major research projects on forgiveness. He won international awards for his work. And it's, that's when people started going pain free. That's when my life changed and my symptoms dropped down because we, when you're angry and frustrated, your body's full of adrenaline. So I do seminars back in New York, and literally in five days, we have our patients in chronic pain, for the most part, just go pain free. So in summary, here's the deal. I was watching the news one night, watching this hurricane come into towards New Orleans, and I realized that the wind represented my racing thoughts. And you can't control a hurricane, you can't really control your thoughts, but also the wind can represent your racing circumstances. And you can't control most of your circumstances. So what the tools do between relaxation, the writing, they pull you right into the center. Then you can, then there's everything else can do what they're going to do. So I'm challenging you to sort of to get happy and connected like now. So the rest of the morning, you know, grab a piece of paper, write a couple things down, start working on the active meditation. It's what we do during surgery all day long. And so I do it in the operating room. My goal is to do it more out of the operating room. We're doing this elite surgeon course in September, which I would invite, encourage any of you to attend. It's all about these performance principles. And it's sort of an expanded version of skill acquisition, stress management, and team building. It's all based on the talent code book that I mentioned earlier. And uh, my wife's gonna be part of it. She's a tap dancer. So she's gonna add a little bit of rhythm and music to it. So I don't, I don't wanna teach people to relax. I want people actually to relax. So it'll be small groups of five or six. We'll have a lot of small group interaction. And it's going to be a lot of fun. It'll be good. You don't have to memorize what I said this morning. This is my next version of the book. It's coming out in October. And when I wrote this book, I knew nothing. I just knew my own experience. And it's worked. We have hundreds of patients going pain-free with this book. But the neuros I must have two or three hundred neuroscience papers in my head when I wrote this book. I didn't put it in the book. I just simply, the, what I, the depth of what I said in this book is much, much better, much more organized. And it's just been a remarkable journey for me. And there's a website, backincontrol.com, which, by the way, is on the back of this book. And this is the, the website right now is more updated than this book. And this will give you sort of a framework of what's going on. But go to the Getting Started section. It tells, it tells about the writing and relaxation. And I have fellows all over the country emailing me about you know, how it's going on. So it's remarkably simple. And um, thank you. <laughs>